Hello, hello, hello. Hello, friends. We are here. We are live with Francine Rivers. Francine, welcome. It's nice to be here virtually. This is, this is so great virtually to be here. Now, you and I have chatted one time before. You were on the happy hour with me. In fact, that show released at the very end of 2020. So it was like December 23rd of 2020. And I need to tell you this, Francine, when we got to the end of 2020, my team on the happy air, we all sit around and we talk about what were your favorite episodes of the year. And I'm telling you, all of us said Francine Rivers was one of the most unexpected favorite podcasts we did that whole year. <laughs> well, thank you. It was such a joy to talk to you and hear more about your story and your writing career. And even we got to talk just for a second there about, um, you know, the movie uh, Redeeming yeah. Love that's coming out. And so I know that a lot of people are familiar with with you and this book and your writing career. But would mm -hmm. you give us a really quick intro as to your career as a writer and what that's looked like? Oh, wow. I started as a steamy historical romance writer and then became a Christian. Uh, and that kind of shut everything down for a while. And I think God was trying, it was telling me that, you know, you want to be my child, but you don't even know me. So we were, we were doing a Bible study during that time. And there's a whole story behind that, but, um, and it just changed the whole, the whole course of my life because we started studying the minor prophets and came to Hosea. So Redeeming Love was the first book I wrote as a born-again Christian. And it was really my statement of faith because I felt like Angel, where I was always running to something else for answers rather than running to God. So You know, it's, um, it's interesting. I was talking to some friends recently, and I'm 43, and I have another friend I was talking to who's in her 50s. And, and we were all saying about how this book was really transformative to our lives when we read it in college, you know? And so oh. here here. We're all reading this years ago, and you just told us this was your first book that you wrote as a follower of Jesus. Yeah. So what does it feel like for you sitting here today? You and I were about to talk about that there's a movie coming out about this yeah. book. You've written so many books. This book has sold millions of copies, and it was the very first book that God ever laid on your heart as a believer. What does yeah. it even feel like today in 2022, uh, looking back on that part of your life? Well, and you know, unexpected. Well, for one thing, I think, why did it take me so long to surrender? Because I was in my late thirties, and I, it, it just, I was so stubborn, and it really took our our marriage was collapsing, and I was looking for answers. And we, when we moved into a rental home, my husband was starting his own business, and this little boy, eight years old, came over and knocked on the door and said, "Can I help you move in?" And he was just sort of pesky, and we, I think, we gave him something just to kind of get him out of our hair. And he's saying, you know, have I got a church for you? And I, you know, I'd grown up in the church, but um, they, and I'm sure they were teaching the gospel, but I wasn't hearing it. Mm. And the, the church that I started going to in Sebastopol, they were, they were literally taking the Bible and going verse by verse, talking about the historical context, what it says and how it pertains to our life today. Mm. And that just changed everything. That is so beautiful. And here we are today. You know, you mentioned earlier in our conversation, even today, that, that you felt a lot like like Angel in the story oh, yeah. that you wrote about um, mm -hmm. as you began to journey into this book of redeeming love. And so how much of yourself did you pour into that book in that time of your life? Well, I, you know, I didn't have her background, but I felt the same way because I, you know, I think we have a tendency when we're not Christians to run to everything, you know, the how to books, advice from friends, you know, whatever, you know, they're telling you. And it doesn't satisfy. It just does not, um, doesn't fulfill that need in you. So it, that is what we, you know, I think people are craving that. I think that's the appeal of redeeming love because we all start as children of darkness and then we're defiant. You know, nobody's going to tell me how to live my life. And of course, I grew up, I was in college in the 60s. So that tells you a little bit about, you know, the mindset of our generation, which is kind of unfolded, sadly, into the next generation, yeah. uh, carrying on the whole idea. And then, you know, from defiant to be afraid, because God isn't asking for little bits and pieces of you. He wants everything, everything that you've ever done, everything you've ever thought, all of that. Uh, and then the humility comes when you surrender to him and you begin to to see others through God's eyes, you know, the, that lens of love that you begin to develop. And then there's joy. It, he, 
some of the worst things in your life can be turned to really good purpose, which is, it's a miraculous. I mean, I think about things that I had in my life. I had an abortion in my college years. And out of that, I ended up writing The Atonement Child because I was dealing with that issue in my life after 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And um, to be able to write and use all the different characters to play out the different points of view of it and have one person that's really seeking God's perspective. It brought a lot of healing to me to write the book because I was able to use the writing as a way of worship. And worship is really God is worthy and going to him for our answers and seeking his perspective and what we're facing. You know, a lot of women today, um, in particular, I know men as well, but I speak to mostly women on my show that are listening. A lot of women today really struggle with letting go of shame. Oh, yeah. And that shame can be almost like a cloud that follows them everywhere. And, and you just mentioned you had an abortion in college. And that's a lot of people's stories. It may not be an abortion, but it, it just fill in the blank. Yeah. Something that they kind of hold on to and they think to themselves, I am the worst and how could God ever forgive me or use me or, or want to do anything with my life? And we just kind of hold on to that shame. And, and Francine, sometimes I think that, that we, we, it's all we know, like we don't know how to live in that freedom. And so for you, you said that kind of led you to writing the, the, another book of yours, but what does that look like for you over your lifetime to not live under that cloud of shame? Not even from what happened in college, although that might be something, but something that happened yesterday or this morning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't get through a day without sinning. <laughs> it's, it's, sorry about that, God. You know, I mean, it's a, a constant, you know, unceasing relationship with the Lord and talking to him because we do, you know, we're we're in a fallen world and we're influenced by the fallen world and we're constantly in that battle, whether we realize it or not. But um and my mind is going in a hundred directions right now. I'm trying to think of what I wanted to say that, you know, I know the guilt, you know, there's a difference between guilt and conviction because guilt kept me captive for years. But I think when we actually go to the Lord and confess and lay it all down, you know, then we come to realize, well, he forgave us all the way back to the beginning. We haven't been able to put it down and forgive ourselves. And that's what I think I experienced. And of course, I was surrounded by people too when I was writing the book and I was going through the post abortion class. So I had that support system. But just to know that God's already forgiven us, we need to, we need to experience that, let go of it and release it and not. Yeah. I always like, like to encourage people. Um, with the, with the truth that when God um, created the world and when he created us and, mm -hmm. and when he knew that we would be followers of him, God wasn't naive, not knowing what we were going to do. You know, God yeah. is all knowing. And so he chose you and me and people that are listening to be his daughters and sons, knowing the ways that we would turn from him, knowing the ways that we would um, abandon our truth. Um, and that's why he sent Jesus. And I always think yeah. to myself, man, when I start to feel like I live under this cloud of shame, I, I kind of remind myself of Jamie, um, if, if, if Jesus didn't take care of this, then all that was for nothing. You yeah. know, like this was all, this was all purposeful for him to come in um, and take this for you. You know, I would like to talk about the movie a little bit, if that's okay with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. when, what year, forgive me for not knowing this, Francine, what year did you write this book? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm not sure I can remember. It's so it's 30 years old, about okay, so, 30, 31 years ago. And and I can't do any math. To I can't do math either. So we'll there, just go there are also two versions because the original was written and published by Bantam. Um, the publisher that I had worked with recognized it as an allegory about Jesus. And they said, we don't publish Christian books. And then there happened to be, happened to be a Christian who was a, an editor at Bantam and she recognized it and she wanted it in, in women's fiction. Then after it came out, you know, you're, you're growing as a Christian all the time. He's slowly transforming our lives. Mm -hmm. And I felt, you know, as soon as the book went out of print, I got it back and I was able to do what I call the redeemed version of redeeming love because there was some, some language I wanted to take out and I wanted to soften a few things that I didn't feel were necessary to the story. So then it was um, Multnomah that brought out the the new edition, the better edition of Redeeming Love. <laughs> and I think that was 1997. I, I can't remember. Well, Years we'll go. 
30 years ago. That's what it was. And that was actually one of my questions I wanted to ask you, you know, as authors, we write things and we grow, like you said, and we're changing. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to ask you if there's something that you wrote 30 years ago that you would change differently now about this story. Um, No. (laughs) That's a good answer. (laughs) No, I think that after I was able to put in the conversion scene, which was not in the original, I wanted that in there. Um, but no, I know, I know there's some scenes that are very difficult for viewers and that will be maybe difficult for people that go to the movie. Um, but no, I, I don't think I'd change anything. It's, it's really God's story. It's not mine. That's so good. What is your encouragement for those people? You just mentioned that it could be difficult for some people and this book is, you know, it's about it's, it's redemption. And it's also, you know, you know, this, I'm not telling you that you don't know. It's also, there's some hard things to read and watch in here um, that Angel and Michael had to go through, you know, individually and then together in the world. And that's real life for a lot of people, but it could be difficult. What is your encouragement for people who are going to see this movie? Well, I know with the book, the first 50 pages were the hardest that I ever had to write because I didn't want to be inside the the mind of that child and what she was going through, but it was necessary to show what the mindset was of Angel and why she was the way she was at 18. When I wrote the script, I wrote it as a linear script. Uh, So you were seeing all that, or you would have, you aren't going to, you would have seen all that up front to know and understand her. But DJ Caruso when he came on board, he's the director. He and I worked together and he restructured. So we're using flashback. And then we worked together on scenes because you can't have God's voice in a movie. People wouldn't understand it or Satan's voice in a, in a movie. Those things are happening in the book. So you yeah. see the spiritual warfare. So it all had to be visual. But I think that there there are parts. It, we, it's PG-13. But they're they're still, you know, she's still being sold into prostitution and you understand what's going on. Um, but know that it's it has a happy ending. Yeah. yeah. With Christ, it always has a happy ending. And and other there are a couple of other scenes that I think might be difficult for some people because like God woos us, Michael waits. I mean, he's an innocent man. He's a virgin and he waits. He's, this is the woman that's been chosen for him by God. And he waits before they can, they consummate the marriage until she understands that she understands love until she loves him. And that scene is pretty hot. (laughs) (laughs) The one before she leaves him and people will know what scene I'm talking about, the hillside scene, but I felt it was necessary. I mean, there's a song of Solomon. God created sex and, and within marriage, it is passionate and beautiful. So yeah, be prepared it is hot. Time. I saw it, Francine. I saw the hot, the hot scene, yeah. which yeah. I just, this is what I say all the time. And I would say it with, with the movie that you're a part of or any movie that ever comes out is that parents and people should go see movies that they feel most comfortable yes. with their children. Yes. There's yeah. great resources online that can tell you everything that's in every movie from, you know, they said the D word to they were whatever, you know? And yeah, so yeah. Um, everyone has the ability to do that. So that's how I say that. I want to ask you a question that someone brought in. Um, this is a question that says this. I would love to know if when you watched the film, you felt like your original story came to life the way you envisioned. And I know that you said that you had, um, that you wrote the first script and then the, the director came yeah. in and helped with that. So when yeah. you saw the final thing, even though you've been hands-on through this whole thing, did you sit back and go, okay, they, they did, they, they brought my book to life. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And there's one scene in there that DJ put together that every time I see it, it gives me goosebumps. I mean, just talking about it gives me goosebumps because he did so beautifully. And it's the re- it's really the reveal scene when she is being forced back into prostitution or Duke is attempting to force her back and what she does to be free. And that scene is amazing. And that I, that's DJ that did that. And I, I couldn't be more happy with it. I mean, I'm blown away. We were able to actually be on set. Um, so we, we saw paradise come to life and, and it really was far more than I ever expected. So that is so beautiful. Um, 
I know the scene you're talking about and, and they did such a great job with that. Yeah. Well, I want to, I want to kind of wrap up our time here and ask you, you know, this, this book and the story is really about um, someone realizing how much they're loved by God. And we see that through this mm -hmm. physical relationship with a husband and wife. What is your hope and prayer as people go to the movies to see this? I mean, this is, a, this is a, a faith-based book that you wrote. There's yeah. a, it's about God and his love for us. And, and, and I, I hope that comes through in the movies. What do you hope for people who are going to see this, who maybe haven't read the book, maybe don't even have a relationship with Jesus? Like what, did, what do you, what gets you excited about people showing up to watch this movie? Well, I'm hoping they're going to walk out of the theater and really want, you know, yearn to have a love like Michael has for Angel. And it could be the other way around. You know, I've always thought, you know, we're watching Michael live out Christ-like love, but it can be a woman that does it. You know, it can, she could play the part of Michael yeah. loving her husband, you yeah. know, so it's, I'm just hoping that people want to investigate Jesus. You know, I love that. I love that. Well, I, I can't get let you go without asking if you're working on anything new right now. Um, I have a new book coming out in February called The Lady's Mine, and it's got double meaning to it. And it, I call it my code book. <laughs> because I thought, you know, we need to laugh. So there's a lot of humor in the in the book. It's sort of a combination of the taming of the shrew in Oklahoma. <laughs> I love it. So but I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. Comes out in February, right? February, yes. Yeah. All right. Well, Francine, thank you so much. You guys, this movie comes out um, in theaters on January 21st, so right around the corner. If you want to go back and listen to our original conversation, which you should, because it was one of all of our favorite conversations in 2020, uh, it's episode number 349, and that came out at the end of 2020. So, Francine, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. It's been a okay. pleasure. Bye-bye.